Uh, this is Drew from the Clubhouse 54 podcast. I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Mason Dixon Distillery, located out of uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Their craft cocktails, uh, their whiskey, uh, they've got some other spirits in their line. Guys, you have to check it out if you haven't. Um, located in Gettysburg, got to check them out. Their food is great. Welcome back to the Clubhouse 54 podcast. I'm Michael Little, Drew Lockhart to my right. We do have a special guest here today with us. He is an Emmy-nominated Hollywood filmmaker, golfer, and friend. We would like to welcome Robbie Fernandez to our podcast. Robert, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, it's great to have you on, bud. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. So we know that filmmaking, golf, and sports are all a passion of yours. And uh, if, if you don't mind just sharing with us just how that all came about, you know, if you want to start even from your early years, you know, and, uh, and just let us know how did how'd you develop this passion for, for what you do today? Sure. Um, I've been um, a film producer and own a, co-own a production company called Moxie Pictures that's based out of New York, uh, L.A., and London. Um, started doing television commercials back in the late 80s. Um, um, and that sort of, sort of created my current path where my company, we still, for the most part, doing advertising is a big part of what we do, but it's transitioned to doing, you know, feature documentaries, television series, all of that. Um, sports has always been a huge part of my life. Um, I played basketball and baseball in college, but I didn't start playing golf until I was out of college. Nice. So, Shout out to the late people that get into the game. Yeah, so yeah, I started playing, and it's always, I, I don't regret, it was always the one thing I wish, I grew up in New York, in the Bronx, so it wasn't as if there was a, there were golf courses everywhere, so it, was, it wouldn't be something that you would look to do. I played basketball, which yep. is what you would expect. Um, uh, but I love the sport and always wish that I would have picked it up a lot sooner. And even more so, I wish when I started to play golf in my 20s that I got appropriate. It was different back then. You, only certain people got lessons, getting fit for clubs, those kind of things, um, which are now a customary never did it so yep. i felt like i wasted a good 15 years of really bad golf enjoying it but not playing very well oh and i completely agree i didn't start playing until i was 19 and i got a left-handed set of tommy Almers that were hand-me-downs and you know back then you know we're talking early or late 90s you didn't get fitted you just went out and played golf um and it's it's one of those things where I, I agree 100% with you. I wish I had taken it a little bit more serious because I can only think of what I would be if I had. Yeah. And I think a lot of it back then was the accessibility. You know, in New York City, there were a handful of public golf courses. Um, and to go there and play, I mean, it's six-hour rounds. It, it was like a full-day commitment to go out and play a round of golf because it was one of the few places where anybody can go. And I remember my, um, when I started to show interest and wanted to play it, um, uh, uh, a guy at the company I used to work for when I first started gave me my first set of clubs, which I still have. I don't get rid of golf clubs, by the way. <laughs> so the, <laughs> I'd love to see like, your garage. Yeah, I have a, we have a barn, and literally up in the loft of the barn, I use the, 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 the trusts across to sort of lay golf clubs. They're literally every golf club that I've ever had, that I haven't given away, I have. Wow. So the first set of irons I ever got to play were a set of staff blades. Nice. <laughs> like you stand over it now, the, the head of the golf club is like three and a half inches long. I mean, it's like trying to hit a golf ball with a piece of just solid steel. It's a true butter knife. And um, I just kept those because you, you can't find anything like that anymore. Um, um, no, one day those will be worth money for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I just, you go out everything, you know, all of the clubs and drivers and you you name it i mean i have hundreds of golf clubs not purely out of just more of like what are you going to do give them to somebody just, just the nostalgia of having them and you know all of the things that i've played over the years so um and of course giving stuff away but with t technology and stuff it, it changes so quickly you have clubs from a couple of years ago they're they're you know 
nobody wants to play with him now. Technology well, you've got you have two sons, so I mean, wouldn't you say that? Yeah, um, my oldest son doesn't play. Okay. My youngest son, who's twenty seven, um, he's now gotten the bug really bad. And Michael knows Matt. I've, and I he's, know Matt and he's as given well. some lessons, and he's a really strong kid. That when he hits the ball, he hits it really far. And we actually played in our. He played in his first real. We played in our uh, invitational at the club this weekend. It was the first time he's ever played in a real, like, structured event. Oh, was that's he, great. Was and he nervous? It was a little bit, but he played pretty well, and we did really well. So he loved it. He performs well under pressure. The, you know, he was a little nervous in the beginning. We made it to the playoff, and the idea of like playing golf and people standing around to watch what you're doing was kind of new to him. Oh, that's great. Um, and um, yeah, it was great. It was just even with the bad weather, it was a great three days of just sharing that. So we play a lot of golf together. Um, um, and to be completely honest, if you know, he's my favorite person to play golf with because it's your kid. And I always notice that you know, working, we all worked uh, at the same place, you were a member there. It was always nice to see you guys always coming out, f smiling faces, and you guys were just interested in nothing but trying to get out there and play golf and yeah. have a good time at it. Yeah. And that's, you know. I mean, that's the best part of sport. You're just outside, removed from everything. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's great. That's why yeah. I love it. You have Honestly, outside of being at home, my favorite place to be is on a golf course, period. No phone, no distraction. And it's just whether you're playing really well or very poorly, which is more that than the other. Um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there's nothing like it. And you try to explain it to people. And those who really get it, get it. It's yep. kind of like a secret you want people to know about, but um, you kind of want to protect it a little bit. Yeah. Because it's. I don't want to be. I love being on a golf course. I just don't want to play for five hours. And you don't want to play with everybody. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, you're free when you're on a golf course. You know, it was. Yeah. I actually played around a golf last weekend with one of my friends um, who I've never played with before, but I've known him since you know elementary school. And he goes, "I've always been afraid to ask you." And I'm like, "Why?" He's like, "Well, because you're better than me." And I'm like, "You don't understand. I'm free when I'm out here." I said, "It doesn't matter what the skill level it is. Doesn't matter what the age is. Like, it doesn't matter. I just want to go out here, have a good time, enjoy myself, and free up my mind." You know, and that's really what I mean. It sounds like that's what golf does to you. As it's well. the beauty of the sport. You know, I, I've been very fortunate to have you know to belong to and have belonged to really good golf clubs. Um, my favorite rule in any golf club is. No cell phones allowed. Love it. It's Drew's Love least it. favorite. Love rule. it. It's my least favorite because I like to showcase, like, when I'm out there with my friends. Now, I don't do it every time, but Michael and I played Salkin yesterday, the old course, with my brother-in-law, who's a member there. And, you know, we did some stuff for the podcast, you know, shooting some videos for that because he and I need to show that other than us sitting on the couch, we're <laughs> out there playing golf, having fun. And it was it was a good time. You know, it's funny because right now I am the worst putter on the planet. The worst. The worst. And it's funny because just I'm going right through. Just right now. <laughs> no, it's, he, he was good. When we were in Florida, like, earlier this year, he was good. And I mean, I, he I, went and changed his I've putter grip. Better, <laughs> I, I changed my putter grip, which changed the weight of the club. It feels like I'm putting with a cinder block right now. And it's funny because he was shooting a shot yesterday. And I was putting, and he was like, you were about to witness the worst putter on the planet right now. <laughs> and it's like I had it transcribed, and it's all on my Instagram. And it, it's just funny because I actually got a kick out of it. And it's, it's no lie, but it's like I like to film that kind of stuff. And I think it's because of the podcast where a lot of podcasts have, have guys out there filming as they're doing it. So their phones aren't out. Right. Um and I think that's where a lot of, like, you know, golf stuff is going. They want to show a podcast, but they want to show you guys out playing golf as well and having fun. It's more of a visual than a, you know, audio version kind of a right. thing. Yeah. Yeah, of course. For me, when I, when I say my favorite thing is a no cell phone, is the people on phones when you're on a golf course. Yeah. You know, for me, I'm not, a big pic I'm not a big social media guy, but I'm not a big picture taker. So... Um, for me, the experience on the golf course is playing great places and having the the ability to have conversation about the experience you had versus like look at the forty five pictures of all of these holes. You want yeah. to find forty five pictures of great holes of on a 
on a great golf course, they're really easy to find. Yeah. It's more about the experiences of being there, you know, not only what you shot and what you did, but how you got on it, what was the feeling of the course, yep. the members, the, all the, the, that experience part of it is is the part that I really like. So, um, Well, the other thing is you're out there with someone or with a group of three people for, you know, potentially four or five hours. You know, the last thing they want to do is watch you talk on your phone the whole time or, or play on your phone the whole yeah. time. You know, they want to get to know you or, you know, your friends. So if you're friends, you, you're you going to want to conversate. You want to have a good time together, you know, build, create the memories while you're out on the golf course. You know, last thing you want to do is say you make a hole in one and I'm sitting over there on my phone and I don't see it. You know, it, it's it, I mean, it's reality of the world that yeah. we live in nowadays. But, um, you know, that's that's what I enjoy. And that's why I always like playing golf with you, because you always take me to these places where I'm not allowed to have my phone. <laughs> My favorite and thing. it's great. So, you know, it's just leave the phone in the car, go out, play golf, walk around with caddies and just catch up yeah. on life. You know, and, and it's, it's great. so much and, fun. And, and business wise, you know, so my business partner, who's a really good player, um, he plays out of the up at, out of the Met. Um, and he's always been like one of the better, like now senior players in the Met. Um, we play a decent amount together. But business wise taking clients to play it was never about talking business i was like it's an opportunity to spend four five six hours with someone a lot of times you don't even talk about business but if you think about how hard it is for certain people to even get a meeting let alone spending an afternoon with someone and yep. making that kind of connection so you know a lot of our really strong like business relationships that has led to you know b potential business and business has come out of golf for sure, because um, you know that that experience that it provides is pretty unique and special, mm -hmm. um, um, and also you get the benefit of just enjoy yourself and playing as well. Well, so. there's a likable factor. Yeah, like once you go out and you you play with a couple of guys and or if even if it's business, there's something where they get on a level of saying, I like this guy. Yep. I can. I want to do business with this guy. Um, and you may not even talk about business whatsoever. A lot of times we don't. A lot of times you don't. But you can tell a lot about a person about how they conduct themselves on the golf course. Yep. I agree uh, with that. Honestly. So, um, so, yeah, so for us, it's, it's always been a part of our business um, directly in doing stuff that's golf related, whether it's an advertising or film or what have you, but also just it being a, you know, we would do like annual trips where we, you know, take clients to certain places and to play that way. So um, th through what I do, it's been a, 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 an incredible conduit to just a lot of opportunity in the sport. Uh, getting to play a lot of amazing places. Right. Now, so, how would that vary from, say, like going to a basketball game or a football game or something like that? I mean, is it – do you get this sa that same feeling or do you, do you take clients to those events? You know, do you get to sta build the same relationship by doing that? Or? A little bit. I mean, you personalize it. I have people that I work with that are – you know, I'm a huge sport fan, a huge basketball fan. So going to games when you're certain places, you know – if we're traveling and we're shooting wherever, um, I would much rather go and see any random sporting event than do anything else. Okay. Catch a baseball game, a basketball, depending what what time of the year it is. Um, um, the, 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 the beauty of golf, I think the thing that it provides is um, the ability to, to – I want to go and play basketball. I just can't go and play basketball at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. <laughs> the beauty of go the beauty of golf is you're playing on places like you know watching the open at LA North and yep. you know I'm fortunate enough to have been able to play there a bunch of times and so the access that you have is great so yeah. a lot of times taking people to play places that they felt they would never have the opportunity to is huge oh yeah is great and understanding the the special nature of it 100% um, my father still talks about the time that you took him up to New York to play golf that he was still fun. talks to me about that, that you know, trip. but it, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a place he will never play there again. I took him to Marion and he's like, you know, what? I'll never play there again. Like that was so special. Like, you know, not everyone gets to do those things no. like you're saying, you know, and it's, it's great to be able to look down at the, the plaques that are on the ground, you know, and you got the Hogan plaque, you got, you know, there's another one with what Sneed over in Philly too, you know, like, and it's just, 
it's it's great to be able to say that you walked those same fairways and then to be able to you know look at somebody that hosted you there and thank them for that you know i mean it's it really is impactful um on people's lives yeah i mean i think with the sport the two main things with the sport that people sort of take for granted is number one access to places where truly the best golfers for the most part outside of a handful of places you can get access to it if you know the right people and number two you know if I'm going to play basketball with someone who's 6'9", you're never going to be able to compete. The yeah. beauty of golf is with handicaps and different – you could actually enjoy yourself, maybe not necessarily compete, but not sort of feel like it's impossible. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Right. So, um, Well, and the other thing is, like, like, I always enjoy this part where you'll play with someone that can hit the ball a mile, you know, but then they can't get the ball in the hole. They're making sevens and they're hitting it 320. You know, you're hitting it, you know, whatever it is, 220, 250, right? And you're making, you're making threes, you know, and they're, lo and then they're looking at you like, wow, how are you so good? Where you're like, oh my goodness, I would die to have that kind of length off the tee. Is that how you felt about me yesterday when you were hitting behind on, from the back tees and I was hitting from the little how, bit forward? How about this? We, we step up onto the first tee and he goes, you're giving me, what was it, six? Yeah, because my handicap's six. You're giving me six strokes. <laughs> he goes, you're giving me six and you're playing back there. I'm going forward. <laughs> That's what I said to him, and but um, I think it's you know it's it's funny when we when we get out and play, it's you know it, it's such a good time. We don't take things too serious, uh, and that's the great part about the game is if you can get out with some guys, and you know you're out there having even if they're business people, and they just know they're out there having a good time, it makes such for a good round. Yeah, yeah, I say it all the time. You know, it would be different if it was my day job, and it's not. And I just have this mentality, um, nothing bad can ever happen on a golf course. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other than getting a bolt of lightning, that's about or, it. Yeah, or you're playing a tight course and you get hit from another fairway. But yeah, but that's okay. Story. But it hurts for a little while. You know, it's not, it's not that bad. So, so I want to kind of spin off a little bit. Um, we've been kind of talking on golf. You know, you've done some really good documentaries and you can some say of, great it's okay oh they great you've been you've done great documentaries. <laughs> thank you that's correct I appreciate it. No, I'm just um and you know there are two that i haven't seen that i instantly want to go home and watch you know in the even with the emmy not emmy nominated one the unknown known um what are some of your favorite you know documentaries that you've done that are not golf related uh, that you, that you have in your in your in your repertoire. Um, I've been lucky to work on a lot of stuff. Um, there's a series I worked on that came out in 2017, 2018 called Wormwood. Okay, that's like a hybrid. It's a hybrid documentary and drama um, about a real story that took place in the early 50s about a doctor and the CIA and all of this testing they used to do using LSD and drugs to try to, you know, this whole program called MKUltra. If they, you remember, there's this, this film called The Manchurian Candidate. Yep. That was based on that. A lot of that stuff really happened. So that was a, a great program just purely based on the scale of what we were doing and sort of, you know, trying to change the form as far as what a traditional documentary would be. Um, but to be completely honest, you, you, it takes so much effort and time to make a film and you're working with so many people, you know, I'm just a producer. So, you know, my job is to be responsible for everything, try to keep everything, you know, under control within regards to schedule and budget and all the logistics stuff. More than anything, my role is to try to provide the resources for the director the creative people, even though I'm a creative as well, but for the lead creative people, trying to sort of give them all the tools and access to things that they need in order to make, you know. So every film is really difficult. Basically, he's making something out of nothing. Um, and with a lot of the docu documentaries, it's like, you know, we're interviewing a lot of folks. You're doing a lot of investigative journalism and that kind of thing with a lot of the films that we work on. So... Um, you know, you meet really interesting people, sort of sit and talk to a lot of people that are a lot smarter than I am, um, that have had a lot of power and influence in this country and in the world. So, um, yeah, it's pretty great. I, I'm 
very thankful to have been, you know, people think of like Hollywood stuff and it's about, oh, celebrities and all of that, which agendas is and that kind of thing. This is different. You know, it's really having the, the ability of trying to sort of dive into a subject and um, you really w want to come up with something not only to entertain people, but come up with something to be able to, for someone to learn something or get access or, or perspective to something that they wouldn't have had before. So um, one director that I do a lot of work with who's, you know, widely considered to be like one of the probably the, the greatest documentary filmmakers ever. Um, He's just a very inquisitive, smart guy that just wants to talk to interesting people. So you go from like Robert McNamara to Donald Rumsfeld to, you know, um, Steve Bannon mm -hmm. to, wow. you know, you know, he did a film that I wasn't a part of that's considered to be, you know, one of the, the, the greatest documentaries, A Thin Blue Line, which kind of changed the genre a bit. But basically he investigated a crime that took place in Dallas, Texas. And he proved and got a guy off a of death row, proved wow. in the film that the guy never committed the crime. That's unbelievable. But the best part was after he got out of prison, he sued him for use of his likeness. Ba basically, almost like you made a film using me. You never had my p permission. It he pulled the name and likeness <laughs> move on him. Oh. I got you out of jail. And <laughs> like, here's your thanks. Thank you for getting me out of off a of death row. Oh, by the way, I'm going to sue you now. It's wow. Yeah, all kinds of stuff happens. But um, well. um, so that's the beauty of that stuff. And, you know, and I don't do a lot of sports stuff. But whenever you do it, it's great because it's a combination of two things that I really love doing film. Deep sport. dive moment. Yeah. So let's go <laughs> right into these sports commercials. We know for a fact that you've worked with Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. You've done a couple of campaigns with Nike Golf with their swing portrait. We've done some Tiger Woods shoe collection stuff that you guys have done. You've done some Roger Federer stuff with Tiger Woods. Let's talk about it. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think it was going to go right there. No, but, uh, it's fine. Um, so, so working with Tiger Woods, you know, what was your uh, your first interaction, and what was the commercial about? Um, it was back the first time we worked with Tiger. It was in the late nineties. Um, it was Tiger. It was a, it was a comedic spot where um, Tiger was giving golf lessons, um, and he would hit an incredible shot, and then a regular high handicapper would then try to execute what he was doing. And th there's one well-known spot where he was talking about what to do when, you know, you have a, like a tight lie and literally it was a lineup of people yep. down the fairway and he hits a shot right down the middle. And then a regular guy comes up and the ball goes and we had all of these car bug cutouts of people. Saw it um, this morning. Yep. So, um, and you could tell it's old because it was the old, Tiger logo. It was, it was like this odd logo that mm -hmm. Nike created for him. So I think that was like in the late 90s. That was the first time we ever, I ever worked with him. Um, and then subsequently over, I would say, the next eight to ten years, we probably did, you know, six or seven d other different campaigns with him. Um, usually every year there'd be a campaign or two that Nike would do. Um, um, and we were fortunate enough to do a bunch of those. We did the spot with him and Federer when they were in competition about who had the most majors, um, because for a while they were really close Going friends. Going back to back, um, you know, we did the first um, Nike golf ball stuff, uh, which was really interesting because it was all these really graphic black and white spots. And the most interesting part of the whole thing was, was there was this guy Rock Ishi, who is like a legendary, very well known. Like he's the ball guy. Um, and Nike brought him over, and he was the one that actually helped to design um, um, when Tiger made the switch to Nike, which was a big deal. When he yep. went from Titleist to Nike, it was a huge deal in golf. I think it was a Titleist ball with a Nike cover. Th there, are, there, are, there are arguments saying that, you know, it was out of the same um, factory almost. If you really think about it, they said it, originally it could have been a Bridgestone ball, which is really interesting yes. now that he plays Bridgestone. Right. But Rock was telling these stories about when they would test balls with him, there was no graphics on the ball. And they would probably give him a bunch of balls and let him hit it. And he says literally within like 1% to 2%, he can tell you the compression of a ball. Wow. He says he's never seen anything like it. That's incredible. He would hit a ball and be like, that ball is like 93% 
and they would do a measurement. It would be 92. Wow. So his feel, there's all of these legendary stories of like when he's testing equipment and stuff. It's crazy. But back to that commercial, that you guys should actually redo that commercial today with the same. I mean, it would get the same attention of some pro hitting it up the with all these people. And then you get a 15 handicap. And I've always said this. If I ever get a line, I'm not hitting one person. I'm hitting multiple people. (laughs) And in that commercial, several heads of the cardboard cutouts were just completely just annihilated. And it's such a good commercial that I still think holds some kind of value today. People would look at that and be like, that is so funny because it's so true. Like It's timeless. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't age. That no. commercial won't ever age. You could put out another version of it with another golfer, and it still does the same thing. It's it's just a great commercial. Yeah, it was good. It was, and, you know, the, the, the origination of the idea, how it works in advertising. So you have a client like Nike. They have an advertising agency. Um, Wyden and Kennedy has been uh, their agency forever. Um, they're the ones that actually come up with the initial creative ideas. Um, like a really close friend of mine, uh, Jim Riswald, who legendary guy in advertising. He's he started working there early on. Um, all of the the Bono stuff, the Mars Blackman stuff with Spike Lee and Michael Jordan, the Michael Jordan Bugs Bunny stuff. All of that. Like, that's all all stuff that he wrote. Wow. So, um, nice. And he's another big golfer, and the best, the absolute best um, golf job, advertising job that I've ever done, or job, best job that I ever did, was um, the first Nike golf thing. We he wrote this thing is called Golf is an Invitation. So, it was a very poetic, like poem to golf and all things golf. Um, And we shot this in the mid '90s. It was the first time I've ever gone to Scotland. Wow. So that job was, he goes, we're going to go to Scotland and we're going to literally work our way across the country, going to legendary golf courses. Wow. Shooting, taking, we were doing print um, and shooting a couple of commercials and we ended up at the old course. But, you know, I'm flying to Glasgow for the first time, started at Turnberry, we made ourselves across the country. We went to Presswick and Gullen and North Berwick and Carnoustie and it was... Oh, that's, and we played. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> played a lot of oh, and we played. And we played. <laughs> and then a really, a really close friend of mine, a photographer, Michael Fay, that was the first time I ever met him. And he's a good golfer. And that's what we would do. So he was shooting photographs. So we'd go and play. And he'd go like, hold on. Take out his camera. Click, 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 click. Okay. So he was the one that really brought into fashion black and white photography for golf. Wow. So in the early days of Ashworth. Right. Yep. So the, when Couples was part of Ashworth, all of their stuff was all black and white. Michael shot all that stuff. Wow. And then Michael did all the original Nike stuff. So the original Hello World, I Am Tiger Wood stuff, the iconic fo- type photograph of Tiger's eyes, black. All, Michael did all that stuff. So all of that. So um, I have all of that photography at home. You know, all of these stuff that Michael has done with uh, Tiger from when I have a huge portrait up in, in my office um, when he just turned pro. So that was in 96. So you have young Tiger Woods back then compared to like now. It's amazing. Yeah. Just How did you get hooked up with, you know, the Nike? Is it through that? Yeah, it's a relationship with the, the agency. You know, we have done a, we did a bunch of different work during that point. Um, we were doing a lot of work for ESPN and a lot of stuff. So a lot of how it works in advertising, the draw to who decision they make is the company, but it's also the director. So if you have a director that they want that does that kind of work, like with that Nike cutout stuff, um, Frank Todaro is a director, and he's, he's, a, he's a top comedy director. So Did you do the commercial with uh, the owner Palmer at ESPN? Uh, no. Okay. Because that was lit. I think, did we do that one? No, that was later on. Okay. So I worked on the first like four or five years of the Sports Center campaign in the very beginning. Got it. Um, and then. With Stuart Scott? Yeah, there was a lot of stuff early on we did with Keith Overman, Dan Patrick, and Stuart Scott. Wow. You know, all the early stuff with like, um, you know. Gordy Howe and the New Jersey Devils when they won the legendary one is when the Devils won the Stanley Cup and there was a spot um, of them drinking from the cup yep. and everybody had like a black <laughs> had like a little um, 
like sore on the side of their mouth as if they caught something. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all from drinking out of the Stanley Cup. And every guy, you're like, here and here, you're like, what? Yeah, it was that's stuff like all, that. That's it's awesome. such a New Jersey thing. It's like they, they win the Stanley Cup. Oh, you it's like, yeah, no, sword. we're all drinking from a cup and all my friends. And we had the cup over my house and my entire neighborhood came over. And you're going from guy to guy and they all like have these sores on their mouth. It's like. So, so who was your least favorite uh, person? That, and then this is. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. He's but not it, answering the question. Okay. All right. I won't go there. Um, so working with the, the sports center guys, those guys are characters. Yeah. And, you know, you give them some little bit of direction, they kind of run with it. Yeah. And yeah, you know, re- you've got professionals. Yeah. I remember in the beginning of that, it was really hard to get people to do it. Because, you know, with the athletes, you're not paying the athletes to be in it. Everything was shot up in Bristol, Connecticut. Yep. Which is... And this was back before Bristol is now what ESPN is. Mm-hmm. It was the a bunch of little now. buildings and a lot of satellite dishes up in the middle of nowhere. So for athletes to go up there was a... But once the campaign came out and it became so successful, then all of a sudden athletes were calling up ESPN and the agency going like, can my client be in a sports center ad? Because wow. they were huge. And it's part of the reason that campaign went on for like over 20 years. Yeah. Um, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spots were done. Um, stuff is great. And then once again, that's all Wyden and Kennedy was the agency. And it's all a combination of that and the directors that work and it's just, you know, and the client just coming up with good ideas that was very much in the spirit of what ESPN was. It was like inside, you know, there was the, the Ricky Fowler spot where yep. he was colorblind. Yep. You remember he thought the coffee was bad. It was orange juice. And yep. it sort of released her like, why would you wear that orange stuff <laughs> on Sunday? so funny. Um, that was so, so good. funny. <laughs> yeah, we did a spot with Fluff um, when he was Tiger's caddy. I was going to say before or after he got fired. No, this was before. <laughs> this was before. Um, and Fluff, he was a great guy. Oh, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, great guy. Um, yeah, no, so stuff like that's fun. For, as a sports fan, it's great. You get time to spend around, you know, a little glimpse around some of these athletes. So we got to touch back on the Tiger stuff. Right. What is your favorite thing that you've done with the man, the goat, T Dub himself? Um, so we did a a fairly nondescript golf spot. Um, we were shooting out in Las Vegas. Okay. And the ending scene for the commercial was a shot of Tiger. Off in the distance, I would say 140, 150 yards. Was, and where he was, there was this high weed, like grass between him and the camera. So it created just a really beautiful shot of him, you know, this soft foreground material, him in the background. And the shot was, it was a slow mo shot of him hitting a golf ball towards the camera. So the first time he does it, he hits it. And, you know, it's, the movie cameras are quite large and we had a long lens on it so you have the camera it's pretty substantial and there was a piece of like board or plywood around the outside of it to help protect anyone behind it if anything happens around it <laughs> he's firing a ball <laughs> i i if i remember correctly he, he had like a four or five iron i don't know um so he hits the first shot flies over the camera so the director yells to tiger and goes tiger I need you to hit a little closer just aim at the lens. He then <laughs> proceeds to take this club and hit a shot that burrows over and boom. Literally, a lens is that big. That's it. From like 140 so, yards so what away. So is that, like, like six inches? Maybe. Okay. Six inches. Ball goes, boom. The camera shakes. The lens shatters. You look at it in, in your front and reveals like shattered glass in there. And everyone's stunned. And Tiger's reaction was, well, you told me to aim at the lens. <laughs> That's, That's so incredible. No, that was, f- was that filmed into a commercial? That or? put at the end of the commercial. And if you, if you Google, like, Tiger Woods smashes camera lens, there is a piece that actually shows the director talking about it. But it's the end of the commercial. And it looks like it's fake. Because you see the ball go like that, and then the lens shakes, and you see the shattered marks. No, all of that's real. I've seen it before. And I, I've I seen was, it, too. I, I was like, this isn't real. But then I remember, I just remember reading about it and saying that they were doing this and that he hit it from that far out. And you can see it. I mean, it's a low burn. And when it catches that camera, like, 
instantly. So you, it it wasn't like Tiger do this. Oh, closer, closer, closer. Two takes. The first one that went over, he was told to aim at the lens. He hit the lens. Shoot over. Wow. <laughs> that wow. was it. So I have they they were it was very cool. So there's a filter on the front of the lens, which is just clear glass to protect the actual um the, the optical elements of the lens yep um and he hit the frame so there's a piece missing and everything else is shattered um and they had him sign it for it so i have it at home it's like one of my prized possessions where i get this frame signed tiger woods that's all shattered and you got to be careful when you move it because every time you move it another little piece of glass oh, falls off oh wow <laughs> so it's in a yeah um but yeah, like just you have like a little stand at home with like no, the glass. Just yeah, you got the cool. laser on there. So if anyone goes to touch no, it, it should be in a box. It should off. be in a box. Yeah, I just <laughs> let everybody know. So my, there's a break in next week. The one thing that's missing is my shattered Tiger Woods <laughs> lens. Um, Our uh, listeners should not be that. No, uh, no please don't do that. That, that would be, be really We're bad. hunting them down. Um, <laughs> don't worry. There'll be an army after them. Yeah, but it's just stuff like that. And, you know, um, he was a consummate professional. I have to say, he's a guy that showed up. He knew people were there to do a job. He was the type of guy when you were told you had an hour, you know, Tiger, you know, because usually what he would do is he would put all of his commitments, like in over two days he would do, back then he was sponsoring Buick and Amex and those kind of things. So he would try to bundle up because usually with their contract, they have to do a couple of commercials a year. So he would go try to get those commitments done to go back to his playing golf. Drive himself, show up, total pro, no entourage, just him. Wow. Well, we know how it goes when he drives himself now to uh, oh, commercials. Oh, come and on. I'm being nice. I'm sorry. He was driving fast on a road that you probably know about, and he was driving fast, and he lost control of his car. We've all done it. I'm not knocking him. But, man, come on, drive somebody. I'm called Drewber by my wife. <laughs> Drew I'm Drew Uber. So she can go out and have fun with her girls. And that girls only know me by Druber, and it's embarrassing. That so is not that, roommate. That, you're that, not. You're not the roommate. Then let's not go there. Um, <laughs> um, but let's. Let's. I mean, again, he can. He doesn't have to drive himself. He didn't need to drive 85 miles an hour or whatever he was clocked at. I'm not knocking him. You know We're what? not he, here to knock him. Put it to you this way: it, the he was in a Genesis. That was the yep. sponsor of his tournament. Yep. And that car. That car fast. saved his life. And that car saved his life. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Um, we don't need to get into all that. No, we don't. But no, but the point I was making, he would show up and literally, if he said you had an hour, 59 minutes into it, he'll be going around going, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow. Total pro. But it was kind of like, you have an hour. Yeah. His but time told is his time. get the robot feeling from him. Like he, not necessarily mentally a robot, but just business like, this is how I. My day is planned, yeah. and this is what I've got to but, do. But, you know, I've dealt with other celebrities and athletes where it's like it's the, they're, it's the last place they want to be. I've dealt with athletes that haven't shown up. Wow. I did a shoot once with a couple of Nike athletes. They made the decision to play golf instead. Mm. Didn't show up. They're going to come the next day. The client was kind of like, okay. I mean, at a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars and stuff. So you hear these legendary stories of like, you know, Charles Barkley didn't, or whatever, Jordan. You know, yeah. I mean, th these athletes have, back then, had the ability to do it, and, and the brands would just sort of deal with it. Um, he was never like that. Was it Rory? No. Okay, good. No, no. Wasn't, a, wasn't a golfer. Okay. Um, Golfers are on time. They're always they're so always it was early. A, it was an Somewhere. athlete that's actually playing golf, like a basketball or baseball player that's actually out there playing golf. My, my wife always yells at me for that. She's like, "If it's a tea time, you'll be there an hour ahead of time. But if it's dinner, you'll show up five minutes late." I can't figure that one out. You Just, know what? I'll tell you this much. Um, I, I have a tea time tomorrow at Saucon. I'm getting there early to take a shower because their showers are that awesome. <laughs> Like, you go to a club, and I'm sure, Rob, you've been at clubs, and he's shaking his head. Like, I don't, he has no idea what I'm talking about. But you've been at a club before, and I know you remember at, at, at several places where you just get in there, and you're like, this is a great shower. Saucon Valley has a great so shower. It's so great you're going to take a shower before and after you're ready. A hundred percent. You're going to double shower I, tomorrow? I will do it and enjoy it. All like, right. I did it yesterday, and it may have been because I had a few drinks on the course, but there's something to be said about a nice facility. Drew's going to shower at the turn. Oh. 
<laughs> he showers. At, wait, wait, where is the guy? He's in the shower real quick. He's like, that's what hockey it. players do. You know, in between periods, they take off all their equipment. They jump in the shower. A lot of them do. I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. I didn't some know do. that either. I'm learning a lot some, today. Some do. They, yeah. they, they do that. You know, the amount. Usually when they go in between periods, they take off a lot of the equipment because the amount of sweat. Right. So yeah, I've heard stories of hockey players that do that, actually, to try to cool down. Wow. Um, um, so what are you working on these days? Like, what uh, what's something that's going on in your world besides um, your golf game? Um, yeah, sort of working on a couple of docs. We're doing a film for Netflix that comes out next um, late next year. Um, doing another thing with NBC Studios um, and Participant Media that comes out probably the end of this year. Um, um, yeah, we've been busy. It's been an interesting time in the film business, you know. Um, there's the Writers Guild strike. That doesn't really affect uh, nonfiction per se, but, you know, there's just a lot of um, sort of turmoil with regards to where the business has gone with streamers, how filmmakers are compensated now because you don't have the traditional box office element to what you used to. So streamers, you know, there's no back end to streaming. Um, and to be honest, the whole AI thing is having a really big effect on the business. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you that, how much AI is affecting your business. Yeah, it's starting to, and it's trying to get some sort of control of it before it goes completely out of control. On a creative thing, because in terms of with writing and rewrites and, and ownership of likeness and all the things that you can do with AI, it's crazy. So I think a big part of it is to try to get some form of controls with that. So this way the technology technology doesn't replace the people that actually perform, that does that work, that perform those tasks. So you, know, you, can, you can go on AI and basically type in, write me a song that rhymes like this about this subject matter, and it's like, yeah. and it's not to say it's a great song, but think about it. I'm going home today to do it. Yeah. Write me a song, Write me a song about, about taking 54. showers before I play golf. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there, there, exactly. There you go, Drew. It's gonna co be called Sock and Ballad. It's called Drooper yeah. in the Shower. Yeah. Drooper in like, the Shower. Drooper in the Shower, man. We need, we need to link up on that, Moxie. It's all yours. No, no, no. That's a gift. That's my gift for you. <laughs> That's so funny. He's like, he doesn't want anything to do nope, with it. Nope, so I'm done. Gifts Coming it. up with the idea. <laughs> he gifts it to me. Oh, that That's right great. You, uh, Rob, you're the best. <laughs> you really are. That is awesome. That's good. How's your golf game? Good. It's been not, not too bad. I played a little bit more this year than I have in years past. You know, Michael knows I go through I go through spurts. Oh, we all do. I go through spurts where we work and travel, and, you know, I may not touch a golf club for a month, which is problematic in a, in a place where your golf season is already short enough as uh, it is right now. I have a so, really good idea for you, then. Uh, I'm sure you do. You, can hi you could hire a golf pro to just travel around with you. Then everywhere no. you go, you have your own personal golf pro. No, I'm not. not I'm not. I'm. I'm not there. That's never going to happen. So, but well, it's good. no, no. He. He. Did you, did you catch that? He said, "I'm not there yet." Yeah. He I was heard. about to say, "I'm not there yet," but he didn't want to sound. You know, he's he's close to it. So, what he doesn't realize is most golfers would do that for golf pros would do that for free just to travel. Oh, 100%. It, it, it sounds a lot more glamorous. It's not that glamorous. <laughs> it's really not that glamorous. You know, uh, if I told people, you know, I've had the good fortune of traveling practically all around the world. And I can tell you what the hotel's like, what the airport's like, and maybe a restaurant or two. But that's that's about it. You know, you're there for work, in and out quickly, that kind of stuff. So we met when I was hired to work at uh, one of the clubs that you're a member at. And, uh, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, we, we kind of hit it off with your son, with you. It, it was a, you know, you're a very easy guy to have a conversation with, which is not easy in when you're dealing with, you know, certain members or, or you know, certain clubs. Um, you know, do you enjoy hanging out with the pro staff at the clubs that you are members at? And, you know, you, you try to form, form some kind of bond with them. Oh, Absolutely. Because I felt that way. No, absolutely. I don't know if you felt it, but I felt No, no, it. absolutely. <laughs> well, the Tennessee thing helped. So the oh, Tennessee, Tennessee connection thing. helped a lot. All day. <laughs> all day. No, absolutely. You know, Michael and I have become good friends, and we spent a lot of time playing golf outside of that one particular place and played in a bunch of places. Um, um, and it helps that, you know, they take lessons from him and stuff. But, yeah, I just love talking about the sport 
um, I'm always fascinated with the, the, the business of the sport. Um, um, like I collect golf books. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very big, I, I love the idea of like architecture and the history of the sport, that kind of stuff. Now, I'm a bit of a ro romantic when it comes to that in terms of the historical part of, of golf and how it's changed. And, and now, even now, over the course of the last year or two, it's what's happened with the tour and living all that. Yep. It's more open in terms of, like, the business of it. There's so much of it oh, yeah. that I never understood or knew or would ever be able to question. And now as you're getting this stuff, it makes you kind of think of, like, how it actually works you know i've had friends that have worked at like the pga uh pga of america not the tour and the, and we've done some stuff with the usga so you try to get a sense of how those actual entities work yep um this is like on a completely different level um, um it, it's a business you know and that's like i would say back in the day like the hogan and sneed days you know they were golf pros you know, and, and they played professional golf and they were on the PGA Tour as head golf pros, you know, and it, over time that has all changed and it really has become more of a business and that playing aspect is not there the way that it used to be. And uh, the, the game has changed and, you know, and now they're trying to make it two different games where the pros have a rolled back ball and the amateurs do not, you know, and that's going to be another interesting time in golf when that yeah. actually happens, if it does. If they roll the ball back for the pros and don't for the amateurs, the game is going to suffer. I, I think will, so too. I will tell you this right now. You can record it, write it down, and remind me later when I said it. If they do that for the pros and don't do that for everybody else, it's going to affect the game. And, you know, that's one thing, one step that they better walk very lightly on. Well, the whole thing is a lot of amateur golfers, you know, and – even to the professional level, we like to measure up to the PGA Tour Pro, you know, and, oh, wow, well, you know, Rory hits it 350. I can hit a 350, you know, and people, they brag about that, and they get they get excited about that. You know, so now all of a sudden if they roll that back and Rory's only hitting it 280, you know, or whatever the number is, um, you know, and now we're out driving the pros, you know, that's that's not a, that's not a good thing for the game. They, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's the beauty of the sport. Really, the only difference between someone like myself and a tour pro is the level of ability, period. I was going to say 15 strokes. It could be a little bit more. Than, you're being very kind. Thank you. Uh, uh, but it's like, but everything else is accessible. And if you think about it with ball manufacturers and club manufacturers, the selling point is you can have this, that you can yep. play the club that Rory plays. Yep. You can play it, even though we're not. Right. But you know most people don't know that. No, they don't unless you're in the um, golf business. And that's the beauty of it. Oh, I could potentially play that course. I could play that ball. I could play that club. Um, and I think financially on a business level, the effect that would have could be tremendous because it starts to really delineate like – like it is with other sports. Yeah. You know, we love football. None of us are ever going to step on a football field mm -mm. Uh, and deal know, with people of that size. I was all state kicker when I was in, in, in high school. Kicker. Drew's all, all state ever. I'm day. just. Yeah, you name kicker. it. You I, we talk football in size and he even says kicker. <laughs> kicker. Have you ever kicked It's a, all coming Have clear. you ever kicked a 40 yard field goal? I, yeah. Never tried. I haven't either, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the other thing with rolling the ball back is when I watch a tour event, I want to see these guys go low. I want to watch birdies. I want to watch eagles. Now, when I watch a U.S. Open, I want to see them struggle. I do want to see them struggle in the U.S. Open. But, you know, like that's one of the things I love about the Masters is think about the back nine on Sunday at the Masters. You're watching eagles. You're watching birdies. It's so exciting to watch that golf tournament. So now if they have a golf ball that's not going as far and they can't reach those par fives and two, or even just, you know, in some cases maybe like number five at Augusta, they may not be able to get there until if we roll it back into the wind. You know, I mean, yeah. it's that's a re very difficult hole now. And, you know, why are we going to make the pros struggle so much when it's entertainment? Yeah, you know, I, it I, is I, an entertainment business. I, I don't get it because for me it's like, oh, look at the Masters. People are winning at nine under, ten under. Yeah. 
You're, you're talking about the best players in the world, period. Yeah. I, I get no enjoyment out of seeing someone win an open at even par. It's kind of great. Right. It should be the golf course. Right. And I think there's a lot of things you could do with the golf course. I mean, look, when they had the open at Marion, it proved it. One under. And it, but they had three days of rain and the conditions weren't as good. So and that stuff struggled. happens. Stuff happens. You know, You're right t- about who, that. Who was it? Ernie Els, I think it was. Somebody said uh, like they're gonna, they're, someone's gonna shoot sixty or something like that out here. I, mean, didn't, didn't I don't remember happen? what. No, I don't remember didn't what the lows. I gotta tell you, L.A. 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 North is a really hard golf course. Big golf course. They had perfect conditions the first the first couple of days. Yeah. That's why somebody, you know, all right. So two guys shot eight under, and everybody was losing their mind. What was the winning score? Yeah. What was it? Ten? Eleven? I think it was eleven or twelve under. Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Yeah. And the two guys that shot eight under were nowhere near the top. Well, I think a lot of things that the people aren't thinking about. Like, let's dial the ball back for the pros. No, let's. They called it tee it forward. Play yeah. forward tees. That's Play it, more. Cl- you know. A, a, enjoyable rounds don't be playing from the backs or further than you need to be when you're having driver three wood into every hole you you do 7800 yard golf courses it only uh, it it gives a huge benefit to the guy that can carry the ball 310 yards not every pro can right you know you narrow fairways you firm up the conditions you know i think I, i don't know about 80 yard par threes but that that hole was hey, – look, I'm Mike – There was Mike, one bogey all week, right? Or, 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 wait, what was that? What round was that? The third round, right? Yeah, third, third round. round. And, it was, and it was Ricky, right? Yep. Ricky mate was the only one to make the, the he, bogey there. And I think he laid up. He want, he was – or he, No, he, he didn't lay up. His, his – his, his, what he wanted to do was lay up and chip on because he felt like that was a better shot for him. Yeah. Um, and then it played like 124 the regular rest of the week. That's yeah. crazy. And stuff like that's great. I, my, my boys make fun of me. I love watching women's golf because not to say I can compete with a woman professional. They would just kick yardage, but it's it's more reasonable. It's more like a game that I'm accustomed to, but it doesn't mean that I don't watch tour golf because the guys, you know, some Roy hits up there and he hits a hundred, 370 yard drive. It's like, that's great. This weekend was interesting because the course conditions and stuff, it just allowed a lot of people to go really low. But that happens a couple of times a year. And he was complaining and about so it the what? most. So you he, want, he was complaining. He was like, oh, this, you know, there's, it's boring, this and that. And it's like, listen, Rory, go out there and play good golf. Win something, and then maybe somebody will listen there to were, you. There were, there were tournaments. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, so I guess the chance of him ever making it on this podcast is not. Oh, uh, we happen. will welcome him. I was going to call more, him, but now with that he's attitude, more than welcome. But if he comes in with this attitude, I'm going to I'm going to have to just. <laughs> hey, the only attitude on this couch right now is uh, his is, uh, mind. <laughs> is DL, come on, Drew. Wow, um, that's good stuff, Drew. Um, so I mean, look, this is this has been extremely educational for me. I mean, I. Uh, there, you, you've taught us a lot about, you know, filmmaking, um, a lot about sports, a lot about ESPN, what they're doing. I mean, you filled us in on things with Tiger. I mean, we haven't had a guest like this on. No, and we this have is, not. you know, I was I was looking forward to it. You know, even this morning, I'm calling him at seven o'clock in the morning saying, what are our talking points? What do we want to do? So we want to, you know, we have this off the camera relationship, the three of us in different pieces. But it's such an enjoyment to have you sit down on the couch with us and talk about, you know, uh, the accomplishments that you've had. I mean, there are not a lot of guys that can sit here and tell us a story about their camera getting dinged by Tiger Woods. (laughs) Um, You know, it's 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 been a pleasure. You know, I can't wait to get out there on the golf course with you again, you know. Um, I'm over at the Bucks Club now, so you're more than welcome. It's n- I know it's not the the Bayons and the uh, Lookaways, but it's the Bucks Club, um, so you're more than welcome to ever come over and and, and to play with me there. Um, if you ever want to, basically what he's saying is, if you ever want to go have some cocktails and enjoy yourself, <laughs> you want to come have a good <laughs> time. Right, but my biggest question is, how are the showers at the Bucks Club? <laughs> you know what? We do have a men's locker room. I've never taken a shower up there because the access. <laughs> There's been women in the men's locker room several times, and it's like the last thing that I need is to walk out 
and them see this without any clothes on. Oh my! And and you know, so the showers at the Bucks Club, I don't know. Um, but you know what? You know what? It's I do have one question. Mm -hmm. So you know, we have this Tennessee, uh, you know, history together with your son that went to the school, the University of Tennessee. Um, you still have season tickets there. <laughs> And uh, I remember, you know, you, you telling me when I worked at Look Away, you're like, yeah, we, we only get down for like one game a year, choose, you know, a game to go to. Um, I chose a game that you guys decided to go down to, um, which was the Georgia game, which was a great game to go to. They're uh, not missing that game. Do you, do you guys see yourself, you know, continually to go down to – I mean, it's a great environment. Yeah, we go down once or twice. Last year we were at the Alabama game. Great game to go to. Um, which um, um, it was the first time my, my son went through college, graduated. He graduated in 2018. Okay. Um, and we still go down once or twice a year when we can for games. And, you know, his, his wish was always having a situation where everybody would rush the field. So it literally took seven years for that wow. to happen. And it took that Alabama game, and it was great. Wow. The feeling, the electricity. They, t I, if I remember correctly, right. so this happened when I was there in in '98 when we beat Florida. Uh, we they took the goalpost down. CBS had cameras on there that were like two hundred seventy five thousand dollars a piece. Those were destroyed, and they took the goalpost down and walked them down the strip to the Tennessee River. And threw them in the Tennessee River. And if I remember they correctly, did, and they did it this year, they got one of the goalposts out. Wow. But I remember after that happened with the Florida game, CBS was like, never again. So, like, if anything, like, was thought to happen, those goalpost cameras were coming down before. Those, the, the camera on the goalpost was off, but the, the goalpost <laughs> came down. <laughs> you could tell they were, they were surrounding it, giving them time to get it off. There was no way you were going to stop the fans. I mean, you're in a stadium of 103,000 people. Yeah, plus. And honestly, there were probably – 50,000 people easily on the field. Wow. Never seen anything like that. And we that. hadn't wow. beaten Alabama in years, so it's a big thing. Yeah, to do that. On the last play, the last kick to win the game, it was insane. I remember my son, we were, we were, behind, the, where were we, at? we were behind the Tennessee bench, I believe. Um, you know, maybe up like 30, 35 rows. And as soon as that kick went through, he just looked at me. He's like, I'm going. <laughs> I'm like, what? He goes, ah. that Did was his exact words. He, we, we were both there. He goes, I'm going. And he's gone. And he starts running down the aisle. And he turns around. He goes like, don't forget the bag. He had a bag of stuff under the chair. And he was gone. Wow. So I'm standing there and everybody's going down. And eventually I was like, I guess I'm going to have to go down and find him. So I walk down. You know, there's a brick wall <laughs> yep. around the, around the, the whole Neyland so Stadium. So I get down to the bottom at Neyland, the brick wall. And I'm like, I'm not a selfie guy. But I, I got to take a picture of like just to prove that I was here. It was pretty amazing. So yep. I turn the camera around and I go click like that. Um, I turn around and there is Matt standing on the Tennessee bench like this. Wow. Going like this. So I have a picture completely not knowing where not he knowing is. where I was like this of my face and there in the back is Matt like this on the bench. So my mm -hmm. wife took it and blew it up. That, that is a picture awesome. of that is awesome. And he's standing like this. And people go like, well, how'd you set it up? I go, I didn't. It wow. was just like, it was so random. I was sitting there like, how long is it going to take for me to find this kid? Oh, yeah. And went down on the field. It was awesome. Now, in, in, talk about electricity. When College sports in general, more football, but the electricity at something like that, when something like that happens, it is so, I mean, it's it's an I can't describe it the feeling that you have and you see all the reactions how people are happy and after you're walking down the streets in in Knoxville and stuff like that it's just electric yeah Knox Knoxville's not a little town but it is a it is it's a large college town UT the the city shuts down especially a game like that mm -hmm. um, the amount of people that are outside of the stadium that don't even have tickets to get into the stadium just to be there wow. is crazy so it seats like a hundred hundred three plus but then they do four or five standing so they get a hundred and seven plus funny, thousand the, uh, I, for, I I forgot what what government entity but they actually noted that when the field goal went through they had like a a, a seismic like jump in sound wow 
from just everyone at the same time going cra- It was so loud. We went to an Oklahoma game when he was in school, uh, which was a great game, and um, uh, they lost to Baker Mayfield. Yep, Baker no, Mayfield. In overtime. Yep, I was in Knoxville. I've never been in anything so loud. And last year, I mean, I think the register was like one, 125 decibels. Wow. It was like you couldn't hear. That's incredible. It was like going to a rock concert to being that, at a football game. That is incredible. So the environment of college football, um, I'm a big college basketball game a guy. So it's just a different college. College football is a completely different beast, even compared to professional football. It's crazy. It's literally these people live for it. Um, so it was great. Yeah, we were down there for that, and it was just awesome. So, you know, um, I went to a small school, so I my my major college experience is living through. This and our in, through sorry, virus. guys, gonna, our intern is decided to die. He's so not even okay. drinking anything. It's <laughs> just like a dry explode. cough. <laughs> like he's it's a dry cough. Are you sure you're okay? He's okay. not okay. He's, he's trying Alabama, to recover. He's, 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 yeah. he's an Alabama Here, fan. You we just found out. <laughs> we just found out he's an Alabama, he's an Alabama fan. fan. <laughs> he's oh, trying to man. interrupt the pod. Too much UT talk. His, his, his last podcast. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, you know, uh, Michael, you know, this has been a great podcast for us today. Absolutely. Um, you know, Rob, thank you for coming out again before – Today, it was Mr. Fernandez because that's how we had to address everybody. And I remember him saying to me, just call me Rob. Just call me Rob. And so now I can actually sit across from the couch and say, Rob, it's been a great experience for you today. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Sure. Yeah. Thank My, you. Thank you so much. First podcast. Never done this before. So. Oh, boy. First timer. We're blowing first timer. this up. First timer. Love it. I'm actually surprised you've never done this before. I, I yeah, I have you just turned everyone down, or so I'm 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 not I'm a behind, I'm the guy behind the guy behind the camera. I anything in front, I, it's not my nature. Well, so well, I mean, this I, mean, uh, then this means a lot. I mean, thank you. Oh thank no, you so much. it's just it's, it's a not step. like I get asked every day. So don't take this wrong. <laughs> but no, of course, it's an opportunity to sit and talk with friends. And well, maybe we need Moxie uh, pictures to do something on Michael and I on a golf course, and you know, spend the day with us. You know, it'd be great. You know, you behind the scenes and everything, telling us what to say, and Drew saying, "Drew, shut up! You're talking too much." We just need we need a lot more sponsors for that, Drew. Hey, m- we can we can make it work. There we go. No, I thanks for it. having me. I really appreciate it. This was, Absolutely, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being on. Sure. Hey everyone, Michael Little with the Clubhouse Fifty Four Podcast here. Uh, just want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Adele Golf. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for the hats. Um, we do have a full lineup of Edel fitting clubs here. We have their putter system, iron system, and their wedge system here at Clubhouse 54. Please reach out.